My name is Rick Dove. I'm with a company called Paradigm Shift International. I'm going to talk to you today about antibody-inspired proactive anomaly detection. What that means is we are going to look for things we've never seen before. Very interesting trick. The, the body does this in the immune system. Biological infections come in an extremely large number of varieties. Most of them come without ever having been detected before, at least the ones that cause us problems. Identification is what's required. We need to find a way to identify an invader before we can call in the army and vanquish the enemy. Antibodies are what actually do this identification process. And we're going to look at how the immune system does this so that we can perhaps learn something that can be applied elsewhere. What's interesting is there are so many different types of invaders that could come into the body, there is no way that the immune system can provide a detector for every possible one at all times. So it's got to figure out how to deal with this issue of we can't field all the detectors we have to. What's a body going to do? In this case, we have four stage processes. First of all, we're going to generate, well, well, the immune system is going to generate a bunch of random detectors then it's going to make sure that these detectors that have been generated don't actually want to detect something you'd like to keep, like your liver. And so we have to do a filtration process. We'll talk about how that happens. Then we stick them, if they pass that test, into a very short life trial period in bloodstream, actually about two days. If they don't find anything in two days, we kill them off, or the immune system kills them off. Uh, if they do find something, we go through a very interesting process of making sure we have a perfect match that I'll show you shortly. So the first stage is detector generation. It happens on a continuous basis, and it happens with a, with a two-element concept here. The first element is one that uses three libraries, B, D, and J, each with a very small number of fixed DNA segments in them. The second element grabs one from each library, glues them together with some random nucleotides in between. We can get 10 to the 9 different kinds of combinations by doing this randomly. Now, before we send them into the bloodstream where they might attack your liver, we put them into what I'll call a containment vessel in bone marrow and thalamus, and we flush them with, with bodily fluids. Anything that reacts to those bodily fluids immediately dies. Anything that doesn't react after some period of time is considered safe and sent into the bloodstream. So we have a filtration mechanism that you can see here. Uh, as I've shown uh, in this case, we're looking at bone marrow, but the same process happens in thalamus. Finally, we release them for detection into the bloodstream. In this case, what we see here are the, the bad guys in black and the good guys in yellow and gray. And uh, what we've what we've got here is, is a gray kind of match, but it's not nearly as good as the yellow kind of match, which has more surface area in contact. And so the yellow guy has passed a certain threshold of uh, affinity. What we have to do now is take this partially good match and improve it so it's a perfect match. And what happens is the, is the, uh, is the uh, partial match clones itself or replicates itself, and those two guys replicate themselves, and they replicate themselves further, and what we end up with is, is a population that grows with a very high mutation rate. The value of the mutation is some of these things are going to match better, some are going to match worse. The ones that match better actually get replicated uh, much faster than the ones that don't match as well, and so eventually we end up with a perfect match at the top of the scale and these guys we like so well that instead of killing them off in two days, they're going to last in your body for 5, 10, 15 years. So they go into a memory, memory regime. What do you do with this if you have a computer application that needs something like proactive anomaly search? In this case, we're going to look for zero-day zero uh, viruses uh, and advanced persistent threats, things that have never been seen before, we don't have signatures for them. We use a very similar four-stage process, a generator of random detectors, a nursery uh, that makes sure that we don't detect stuff that is of no interest to us. Then we put them into service. 
those uh, that uh, are in service and find something interesting, we let them stick around for a long time. What we call this is a self-organizing, resilient network sensing capability. And we're talking about putting this capability at every node in a network. Here's the uh, larger block diagram of how all this works in a hierarchical, uh, cortical-like pattern recognition system. I'm not going to talk about this in any detail. It would take a lot more than the five minutes we have here. Come see me at the poster session. What's interesting to note is that with 256 of our gang detectors, we can cover almost 100% of all possible invasions that can happen. Thank you.